Um, my name is Ray Lawson. I'm the president-elect of the AAMD, and I'm very pleased to welcome everyone to this special webinar, which is the final one for our 2014 celebration of National Medical Decimetrist Day. Attendance has been amazing for this week for these webinars. More than 1,100 treatment planning professionals from over 25 countries have participated in at least one of the webinars for this week, and that is outstanding. We hope that everyone has enjoyed the webinars and found them to be valuable. We thank you for participating, and we salute you for what you do for your patients and the medical dosimetry profession. We want to thank Dot Decimal for providing today's webinar. As one of AAMD's corporate partners, Dot Decimal provides educational content, funding, and other resources that helps the AAMD offer important programs for medical dosimetrists, and we are very appreciative of their ongoing support. Today's webinar, Specially Fractionated Radiation Therapy, GRID, is being presented by Pamela Myers. Pamela is a medical physicist at the Harris Health System Smith Clinic in Houston, Texas, and an associate professor at Baylor College of Medicine, Department of Radiation Oncology. Please welcome Pamela Myers. Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can uh, see my screen by now. Please uh, write something in the, the question box here if you can't see the screen. It should be sharing with everyone now. Um, so I'll uh, go ahead and start then. Thanks for the introduction. Um, like he said, my uh, name is Tamil Myers. I work at uh, the Baylor College of Medicine. Specifically, I work at the Harris County Smith Clinic in uh, Houston, Texas. And today I'll be talking to you all about spatially fractionated radiation therapy using the GRID compensator. And this talk is uh, sponsored by Dot Decimal. To begin, here's a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to go through a pretty thorough introduction of the grid compensator itself, the purpose of why we use spatially fractionated radiation therapy with the grid, um, the fractionation and typical dose scheme for using this grid, some of the previously published studies, and a quick look at MLC versus collimator-based grid therapy. I'm then going to go into the actual treatment planning using the grid, and we'll talk about how to set the patient up in CT simulation, how to do the beam setup in your treatment planning system, uh, the output measurement and hand calculation for the grid field, and then I'll talk to you about actual grid treatment delivery, how it looks on the day of, how you set up the patient, and uh, the localization that we use here for the patients. And then I'll go through a couple case examples that we've actually treated here at our clinic, which I find to be very interesting and really the reason um, we use it. And uh, then I'll go through a brief conclusion at the end. So just to start, this is a, a couple pictures of the grid compensator itself. You can see that um, uh, it's a giant block, basically, of brass. And these, each of these holes are milled by dot decimal. So you order this through the company, order it by dot, de dot decimal. You tell them your linear accelerator model, and they uh, configure this grid for you and send it to you. So they expertly machine these blocks of brass such that the holes are divergent uh, with your linear accelerator, so that they match um, the divergence of your linear accelerator. So um, as you can see here, it's about 7.6 two is what they quote there uh, for the depth of the block, and it weighs about 15.8 kilograms. So it, it's um, a fairly heavy piece of equipment. The hole centers uh, for our grid, for our Electa Infinity, are about 2.1 centimeters uh, from center to center and about 1.4 uh, centimeters in diameter at the machine ISO center. Okay, the grid compensator can irradiate a maximum field size of 25 by 25 at, uh, patient, at the machine isocenter. Uh, like I said earlier, the holes in the compensator are made to match the specific divergence of your linear accelerator. So when you, uh, when you go to dot decimal and say that you want a grid compensator made, you will tell them the make and model of your Linux so that they can do this matching for you. Um, the grid will then come fixed on a tray, and this tray can slide directly into your blocking tray holder on your linear accelerator. The purpose of spatially fractionated radiation therapy, or SFRT as I'll refer to it probably from now on, um, is that you can use this grid compensator 
to treat through these small openings in the field. So it, it's mimicking such things as high-dose brachytherapy. But um, we found that the grid can benefit large, bulky tumors that can be limited by normal tissue toxicity. So uh, very large tumors uh, cause for very large treatment fields. A lot of times these treatment fields can't be uh, treated to such high doses because of normal tissues within the field or near the field. So this can help uh, with that uh, limitation. By treating only through these small openings, you can spare uh, areas that are under the skin block but treat the other areas in the open holes. So you can use a high single fraction dose and the patient can tolerate it very well because you are still sparing some of the skin at the same time you're treating uh, a large portion of it. So like I said, grid therapy is uh, made to benefit patients with bulky tumors. That's generally described as patients that have tumors that are greater than 8 centimeters. And uh, these are patients that probably don't respond to traditional therapy. These are, uh, in general, large, very aggressive tumors that uh, may even be growing during conventional radiation fractionation. So these are patients that may have previously undergone chemotherapy and failed, not responded, their tumor is actually growing. It could be patients that you're actually treating conventionally with radiation therapy and you're finding that the tumor is actually growing upon radiation therapy and uh, is not going to benefit from traditional therapies. And I think I just got a question. Yes, this PowerPoint will be on the WMD website, I believe, after. So you will have this. Um, and then these, um, so this is, this is the kind of therapy that's not to be used for all patients, but there's a specific patient load with large, bulky, advanced tumors that won't respond well to traditional techniques. And you can use this technique to benefit these patients. So the exact biological response of the grid is actually not fully known. A lot of people um, believe that this high single um, grid dose will incite the reoxygenation with the high tumor cell kill that you'll be giving with this high single dose fraction. Uh, by uh, inciting reoxygenation, you can have maybe a more rapid tumor response and a higher efficiency once you start treating uh, your patient with traditional external beam after uh, the grid. Another uh, biological response that people um, suggest may be coming from the grid is the bystander effect. With the um, high direct cell kill through the holes of the grid with the high uh, single dose fraction, uh, we, they believe that uh, indirect cell kill of the nearby cells can happen with the re release of cytokines upon the death of these uh, direct hits. As far as fractionation and dose uh, goes for GRID SFRT, um, generally it's delivered um, as a single fraction to a dose between 15 to 20 gray. So this is a single dose of 15 to 20 gray. Uh, here at our clinic, we solely use 15 gray. That's kind of where we settled. But um, I had seen 15, 18, 20, anything uh, in that range. And uh, we always use 100 centimeters SSD. Uh, the, uh, after, after in our clinic, we do these prior to our external beam radiation. So we'll do this at the beginning, and afterwards we'll follow with a traditional radiation therapy regimen, whether it be definitive or palliative. So you don't, we don't take into account this grid dose. In theory, this grid is only treating areas of the tumor, so we're not worried about normal tissue cumulative dose here. And, um, you treat it almost as if you didn't treat the grid at all. So you, you treat to the same dose level you would have treated without the grid. Okay, oops, sorry about that. Let me go here. So I'm going to go through a couple previous studies. So I think they're very um, interesting and they really shed some light on how the grid has been used because it has been used for a long time. It's just uh, not in the main uh, stream here. Um, we have, no, I just got a question, um, have I ever treated with a grid alone or without a conventional RT later? I, at our clinic, we have not. We always follow it by, uh, with a traditional external beam after. But uh, as you'll see as I go through these studies, um, some people have done studies where they just treat the grid. And I will show you those and uh, talk about their results there. And I'll tell you, it'll kind of tell you why we follow with external beam. 
Um, so in uh, Mahudin, he is a, a major proponent of grid therapy. He's written several papers. They're, they're very helpful. I'm going to go through a, a few of his studies here. So in this first study, he had a total of 61 grid patients. And I, I provided the table here just so you can see that it's not limited to a certain um, anatomical region. They're, they're all over. He did anywhere from GI to head and neck to breast to lungs. And these are all very bulky tumors greater than ACM that he treated with grid therapy. So in this study, the follow-up for these patients uh, ranged anywhere from 1 to 28 months. And they had an overall response rate of 91%. So here's where I'm talking about for the, the person who asked the question uh, with the grid alone or with RT later. For 80, there was an 86% palliative response for patients treated with the grid alone, no external beam. However, patients that received external beam after the grid, 92% um, of those patients had a response. So the response is generally higher with um, conventional radiation following. And uh, you'll see that there's also a note there's complete palliative response was actually higher with um, external beam doses greater than 40 gray. So that's something to take into account when you start planning these. If you want to just do the grid alone or you want to follow it by conventional. Our technique is we always follow it as conventional therapy. Uh, Mahudin published another study in 1999 which actually evaluated not only the effectiveness of the grid therapy, but it also looked at the toxicity because we're, I mean, we're giving a very high single fraction dose so toxicity is very important um, to look at. Uh, I just got another question. What is the response that was seen? No further growth. The response in his case was just showing any sort of response, either whether it be a uh, palliative response, so pain response, uh, bleeding response. Um, he, didn't, he didn't actually specify if they were all no, no further growth. But there were, uh, I'll show you in another study, there is um, an actual uh, percentage of those that uh, where the, the tumor has actually regressed or has uh, arrested, been arrested the tumor growth. So, but in general, like these patients are very uh, far along. They're very advanced cancers. So in a lot of the cases, what you are looking for, not only to, to slow down the tumor growth for it to not grow, but to alleviate some of their pain. So um, a lot of his uh, numbers are based on a palliative response. Um, so this second study he, uh, he showed, he had 71 patients with advanced bulky tumors, uh, greater than HCM, that they treated with GRID. He was over a period of around three to four years. Um, uh, eight of these patients were treated with the GRID and then was uh, followed by definitive therapy. So they were actually treated with an external beam dose anywhere from 50 to 70 gray. And then after that, they received surgery. 47 uh, of the patients were treated uh, with the GRID and additional radiotherapy. So this would be more of your palliative cases here. And then 14 of the patients were actually treated with GRID alone. So for the palliative patients, 78% um, had a response rate for pain. So out of the palliative patients they treated, which was all of the patients besides the eight definitive cases, they had a 78% pain response rate. Uh, they had a, this is the, what I would, this will owe to the question, um, the last question I received. This is a 72.5% response rate for mass effect. So m meaning that the tumor arrested and tumor actually uh, shrinking there. And uh, for the patients they treated in response to bleeding, if I um, forget the number off the top of my head, they had a, I think six or eight cases that they actually treated the grid for bleeding and they had a 100% re uh, response rate in that category. For the eight definitive cases that they treated with GRID and external beam, uh, they had a complete uh, clinical response that was seen in, in five of the patients. That's 62.5% of what they had treated. And they had a pathological complete response um, as seen from surgery in four of the patients, so 50%. The important thing that I think the study also highlights is out of the entire group of patients, the entire 71 patients they had treated with a large single fraction grid dose as well as external beam, they had no grade 3 late skin, subcutaneous mucosal, GI, or CNS complications. So I think that's something important to note. Not only was the grid shown in this case to be effective, but it was also shown 
uh, to not uh, provide any grade 3 toxicities because you do have some skin sparing effect uh, with the grid design. Uh, the last study I'm just going to go through real quick was also by Mahoudin. He did it in 2012, and it was uh, more of a case study. It was very interesting. He uh, published it uh, for a large high-grade extremity sarcoma on an 82-year-old female. So this was actually a right rapidly growing upper extremity sarcoma near the patient's humerus. So they originally were treating her with conventional external beam. After 10 grays, she received two gray per fraction. After five fractions of her conventional external beam treatment, they found that the tumor volume was actually increasing. So there was no response to the traditional fractionation, and the patient was actually getting worse. The tumor was growing. So they decided to emergently treat with the grid to a dose of 18 gray for the single fraction to a bulk of the tumor volume. So with just the tumor volume, they treated with the grid to 18 gray. After that, they followed uh, up with 11 more fractions, um, with two gray each. So they gave a total external beam dose of 32 gray. And in addition to that, they had the 18 gray for the single fraction grid dose for this patient. Um, and this is what they saw for this patient, this patient. They had a tumor growth that, were, that was suspended within 10 days of the grid therapy. So before, when they had a, um, they actually saw the tumor growing on conventional therapy. Here, the tumor growth was actually suspended within 10 days of treating with the grid. Uh, they were then able to for, perform surgery after the radiotherapy, and they found that for this patient, they had a 90% tumor regression rate based on the uh, pre-radiation volume of the tumor and a 99% necrosis rate. So in the paper, they quote that normally for these advanced, um, large, bulky extremity tumors, you have maybe a 0 to a 0.5% radiological regression rate for comparison studies for um, conventional treatments. But with this treatment, they were able to achieve a 90% uh, tumor regression rate. And here are some actual pictures, which are uh, very interesting. So in the top left, you can see, actually, this was her prior to any radiation. So this is her upper right extremity. She had, um, this is her external beam field. They're showing there. So you can see the external beam field on the top right uh, with the GTV um, outlined in green there. Um, you can see, so the external beam field is an open field. It's treating not only the tumor, but it's also treating a large portion of the humerus. Um, however, you can see that in C, they're actually showing the patient's tumor getting worse. It's growing. It's not benefiting from the conventional therapy. So in, in uh, section D down there, bottom right, you can see that this is the grid field. So they then decided to do a grid. And you'll see the grid field has the same, has a GTV still highlighted in green, but you'll notice that the MLCs in this case, because this is the grid field and the grid is designed to only treat the tumor volume, you, um, you have to block out any normal tissue. So here they blocked out all of the, the normal tissue, meaning the humerus in this case there, and a good uh, portion of the skin at the top. So, so it, it's important to note that for grid therapy, the design of the grid therapy and the purpose of the therapy is not so much to, for full coverage. It's not, uh, it's not your typical case that you're planning. Like, uh, it's, it's not something that's pleasing for the doctors to see originally. It's, it's very confusing for a physicist and, and, an, and a dosimetrist as well when you see these plans and you see that you're not covering the entire tumor volume. But the design of, these, um, of the grid is to treat as much as possible of the bulky tumor, but do not treat any of the normal tissues and spare normal tissues because really you're just trying to incite this rapid reaction cell kill so that you can continue with other therapy. So that's a, that's a very important thing to note, and that's exactly why those MLCs are covering the humerus there, because you are not to deliver a high dose in a single fraction to these normal tissues. Then continuing on with that study, so um, A and B are the MRI from pre-radiation, so you, you can see that large bulky tumor right there. And then in C, you can see the patient, that's the patient actually six weeks post-radiotherapy. So this is post-grid, post the uh, extent of her external beam, and you can see how much the tumors regressed just upon radiation therapy and grid therapy there. 
and you can see in DNE, that's actually the MRI after um, six weeks post-radiation. You can see how much the tumor has gone down and lessened. And then in F, you see the final um, product after surgery, um, and the patient looks um, actually fairly good and had a very good response. The last thing I'll, I'll talk to you about in this introduction is um, MLC versus compensator-based grid. So, so up to this point in, in this whole seminar is actually about using the compensator-based grid from dot decimal. Uh, in theory, you can also use a multi-leaf collimator to generate a grid pattern for your dose delivery. That would include several segments, several control points, creating a grid pattern um, without needing the grid compensator. So, however, when you do this, and there, there has been a study, and I'll show it there as a reference uh, by Bucky et al. Um, and there was a study done, and obviously your MLCs are going to require much more monitor units because it's several small fields pieced together. And in this case, you can increase the MUs um, over a 500% versus using the grid compensator. And, and what does that cost you? Well, cost, this high amount of MUs results in a greater leakage to the MLCs and increases your surface dose. So you have these areas that are supposed to be mimicking the portions of the, that are blocked in the field. So the portions near the holes that are actually supposed to be underneath the block and not being treated in order to save the skin reaction. Well, these areas using MLCs are subject to a much greater low-dose smearing, which I'll show you in the next slide. And so you're, you're really maybe not getting the true benefit of what the grid is. The grid allows you to block much more of the skin and spare the surface dose, the higher surface dose, and it's low dose smearing um, instead of using your MLCs. And also using the MLCs, because you have to use so many more monitor units, you have a much longer treatment time compared to what you would have with the compensator from dot decimal. And this treatment time just translates into more time for the patient being on the table, more opportunities for the patient to move, which is obviously something that's of concern for such a high-dose uh, treatment. It's a more interfraction inter movement of the patient possible, and just more uncomfort. These patients are, have advanced disease, and generally it, it's quick, you want to treat them as quickly as possible. You want them laying in the treatment position as uh, less as possible. So you want to, um, in this case, the compensator provides you with a much quicker treatment versus your MLCs. And here is a picture from that paper I was talking about from Bucky. And um, you can see on the left is um, a generation of what, what the grid may look like in your treatment planning system. Um, this is what they, they created it for this uh, in, into their treatment planning system. So you can see that you see where the holes are being treated with the isodose lines, and you can see where the areas are blocked, and you'll, you'll see no, uh, no dose there. However, if you, if you take a look at what the MLCs might look like when they plan the MLCs actually with their machine, on the right, you can see, you do still see the, the uh, dose spear, I call them spears, they look like spears of dose, where the holes might be, and where they're uh, supposed to be mimicking, but um, the low dose you see smears out. Um, throughout uh, the treatment field and may, may not be giving you the overall benefit that you're looking for. Um, I got a question here that says, what uh, treatment planning system can do compensator-based grid planning? Um, currently, the, the compensator is, and, and I'll go through this in a little bit, how um, we are actually doing this. Um, the general, it, it's more of a, a blocking so typical, similar, we use it similar to our electron blocks. We, use, we do a hand calc, we do a, um, an output measurement, we don't actually input the grid into the treatment planning system. We visualize the um, treatment field we create, and then we use the hand calculation to get the number of monitor units. So in this case, you can see in this paper, and I'm sure that's why you asked, is how they got this into their treatment planning system. This is a pinnacle. Uh, true and planning system here, which we actually don't use in my clinic, but the, the, for this paper, they uh, used Pinnacle, and then they actually were able to export the um, the modulation of the MLC. They're able to export. I'm trying to. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the type of um, uh, 
data that they sent out, but they were able to insert a or mimic a grid by putting, you know, ones ones for full penetration in in a binary format, ones for full penetration in the hold area and the blocked areas they used zeros and they imported that um, uh, quote their idea of what the grid would look like into their treatment planning system. So is that a perfect representation of the grid? Did they actually plan it with, uh, with the exact specification to the grid? No, but they used that for this paper in order to mimic how the grid would look. So I'll, and, and, and keep ask this question again at the end if you don't quite understand how we do it, but I'll, I'll show you throughout the presentation how it is that we use our treatment planning system to um, plan these grids and to um, get us to where we need to be for these plans. So for CT simulation, um, in general, you want to use a strategic angle of the patient or move the patient somehow so that you can obtain a maximum tumor exposure while minimizing normal tissues, if possible. Say, for example, you have a head and neck patient with a large bulky tumor. Um, it may be possible to turn their head before you create their mask, and that can help you expose more of the tumor if it's on their neck region. If you have a chest um, uh, tumor, maybe you can angle the face away from the tumor so that you uh, won't exit through the chin or, or things like that nature, and that just comes from from looking at the patient and kind of deciding when you see the tumor what you think the angle might look like. And I'll show you um, some patient examples from our clinic here. So this patient on the left, you see here, uh, I don't know if you can tell, on his left neck he has this large uh, bulky tumor protruding from his left neck. And so be prior to putting on his mask, we turn his head slightly such that the beam could go through um, a large portion of the bulky neck tumor without treating his chin. And on the right, the picture here, clearly there's a large chest mass of this patient. And we use the mask to angle his face away from the tumor so that we would be able to treat more of the tumor without hitting any of the normal tissues on the face. So once you've done your CT simulation, you import your CT as you would any other patient into your treatment planning system, whatever treatment planning system that might be. Um, so at this point, we'll then set up a static beam um, to enter only through the tumor. So for um, these, uh, these patients, you set up a static beam just like you would maybe a 3D conformal plan, but you would generate the static beam such that as a dosimetrist, this is your, your job and your, your expertise is to say, okay, I think that this collimator angle, I think that this table um, rotation is going to give me the maximal tumor, tumor exposure in the field and let me move my MLCs to block any normal tissues. So I can um, get rid of any of that. Sorry, let me see. I have one more question here. It says, um, any cases where you wanted to use SFRT but couldn't due to proximity of critical structures? Um, I mean, I would say there are definitely those cases. I mean, this, in general, we, we don't use the grid on uh, bulk uh, tumors that are too close to normal structures or are tumors that, are, that we don't think would benefit. So if, if there's normal structures so close to the tumor that even angling and even um, treating, you won't be able to get a good uh, majority of the tumor in your grid field, then they, then they may not benefit. It may not be something you'd like to choose. But in general, these patients, um, our patients, when we choose whether or not we want to use the grid, it's usually because there is a large bulky tumor even protruding from the skin, protruding from the patient. and. That allows you to get a large bulk of that tumor and only treat the tumor and uh, block the normal tissues. Uh, but however, in those those papers I presented earlier, like Mahudin, they they treated um, bulky tumors anywhere, and they I mean people have treated them in the abd abdominal region and things like that. So um, there's always there's usually a way to block the normal tissues. However, if you if you find a patient and uh, it just doesn't the normal tissues just can't be blocked enough while treating enough of the tumor, then probably the grid therapy is not the way to go for that patient. The grid is, is very effective, but you need to make sure that you're using it um, 
effectively at the same time. You need to be using it for the right patient population and for the, the right um, the right reason. Uh, so uh, when you so you set up your beam here, you set up this uh, static beam um, as a dosimetrist. You angle the couch, the collimator, um, however you need to maximize your tumor exposure. And you'll see that in the field. And then you'll drag your MLCs or create a structure and um, conform your MLCs so that you're not treating any of the normal tissues and just the tumor. And the, I'll, I'll say it again because it's very, it's a very uncommon thing and it, it's very surprising when you first plan these. You, a lot of the times you, you won't be treating the entire tumor. The entire tumor will not be in your treatment field because of normal tissues. You will have to block, like in the case I showed earlier, they had to block a lot of the humerus and that eliminated a lot of their tumor. So you aren't trying to um, cover your whole tumor. That's not the goal of the grid. You just want to cover a bulk of the tumor and get dosed to a bulk of the tumor. Uh, so uh, moving on, so for our grid patients here, like I said, we use 15 gray. We've had, we've treated, uh, we've only had the grid, I think now like four or five months, and we've treated three patients, which is actually uh, a pretty high number for for the certain patient population. Um, and we always use a fraction dose of uh, 15 gray in a single fraction, although um, you can use anywhere from 10 to 20 gray. However, if uh, you look at Mahudin's first paper that I talked about, he, he showed that doses um, greater than or equal to 15 gray had a 100% palliative response versus only a 79% for less than 15 gray. So um, uh, that's, that's why we've chosen to use 15, and uh, that may be something you would uh, take into consideration. Um, I have a comment here that says that uh, someone's lost sound. Is anybody else having trouble hearing? Can people can people hear, or is the sound lost for everyone? Okay, so we still have people that can hear. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry if uh, you've lost sound. Maybe it, it might be your computer. You can do something there, but I'm going to uh, keep going because I'm having a lot of responses saying people can hear. Um, uh, so we'll move on here. So for us, we use a beam ISO center. We place at 100 cm SSD for our beam. So our uh, machine ISO center and the way Don Decimal makes uh, these grids is so that the central hole, the center hole of the grid, is actually located at your machine ISO center. So your machine ISO center is directly under the center of the center hole of the grid. It's located in an open portion of the grid and not underneath the block. Uh, our dose is then prescribed uh, to a point at Dmax for the given energy you choose. So at our clinic, we have, the, we have 610 and 25X. We choose for our patients to only use 6MB uh, due, due to any concern for neutron creation because you are using a high number of monitor units. And that's just what our uh, physicians feel more comfortable with. So we always treat with 6MB. Um, uh, and that's our own personal choice. So our Dmax would be about 1.6. That's, that's the depth to which we're going to prescribe to for our point. Um, now, I'm sure there's going to be questions of if you have a huge tumor, uh, wouldn't, it be bene wouldn't it benefit more from a higher energy? You would get more dose, more dose to the tumor. Well, yes. Probably there is going to be some trade-off with um, neutrons and higher surface dose, and, and that may not be that much of a concern. But the other thing to remember is the goal of the grid and getting just some high dose into the tumor to incite cell kill, not to cover the whole tumor and not to make sure your dose goes straight through the tumor volume completely. That's not the point. So it's just a single field, single dose to get some high dose into your tumor to incite a reaction. So um, basically, I'm just telling you, we only use 6MB for our cases. So we prescribe to 1.6 cm with 100 cm SFC. Here's some examples of our um, beam setups for um, the three patients that we've treated already. On the far left, you, you can see that our dosimetrists have strategically angled the couch and the collimators so they think that they are maximizing the tumor exposure. And you can see, um, it's a little bit hard, but the MLCs you can see are blocking uh, any areas of extra normal tissue that may be outside. 
and exposing only the tumors. Um, and you can see on the far right, we actually are using the MLCs to block out the chin of the patient. We don't want any dose entering through the chin. We are very, very careful to only expose the tumor volume within our field and not expose these normal tissues to this high dose. So, so this is your treatment planning system, and you've created this um, static field, and it's only covering your tumor at this point. At this point, um, you can, for visualization sake, prescribe to your depth of Dmax your, your prescription dose, so in our case, 15 gray. You can prescribe that, and, and we often do, just so that we can see the isodose lines. We like to be able to see the full extent of the isodose lines, just as a visual um, reminder that we aren't treating any of the surrounding normal tissues, that, the, uh, that this isodose lines are just going into the tumor volume, and, and it's just really for visualization. It's not because that's the, the bowl is going to be treated. Obviously, there will be a grid in the way, so it's only spears of that total volume will be treated. But it's good to see the full isodose on there so you can see the depth to which um, you would go if you were going with an open beam, and you can see how you're blocking out um, your normal structures. Uh, you then prescribe to uh, your DMAX at 100 cm SSC. Uh, with your beam isocenter located in the center of the center open hole of the grid. So you know that your grid is located at the um, center of your machine, center of your beam, so that's where you will prescribe to under that center hole. Uh, you then, because, because we don't have the grid in our treatment planning system, because uh, we don't have currently a way to get it in there, um, we take an output measurement similar to what we do for our electron beams. So we, for each patient, we conduct a patient-specific output factor measurement. Um, so we will transfer this um, treatment field, the dosimetrist has planned to, uh, to treat with the grid. We transfer that field to our record and verify system so that we can get an output factor measurement. So in order to get our output factor measurement, um, I just got a question, what size ion chamber do you use? We use a pinpoint ion chamber uh, because it's um, very small. And it, uh, these are fairly small holes, although at, at, ISO, so at ISO it's only about 1.43 um, cm. However, if you, you do kind of think about these in terms of output, and it's a relative output measurement. These aren't absolute measurements. It's relative because you're, you're going to normalize it by an open field. So the size of the ion chamber, you really need to make sure that you are consistent. So um, I got a question, how is, how is that you localize? Um, let me try to go through this and see if, uh, see if I answer that question. But uh, basically what you do is you set up this, your solid water phantom, you put it at 100 cm SSD with, with your insert with the ion chamber at Dmax, 1.6 cm for 6x in our case. Now, we know that for our solid water phantom, these are designed to insert the ion chamber at the center of uh, your beam, at the cross center of the crosshairs. So if you have your solid water set up to where, uh, similar to any other physics measurements, you set up your solid water to where you know where the crosshair is. So you set up your crosshair to the center of your solid water, which you can visualize as a light field. Um, and then knowing where the center of your crosshair is on your solid water phantom, when you insert the ion chamber in the phantom, you know that your ion chamber will then be at the center. It's, it's, it's the same for any other sort of monthly output measurements, if this may do, or, or things like that. You, on your solid water phantom, when you set up, you set it up um, to a known area where your ion chamber will be in the center of the field, uh, whether that be because you've marked it on the outside of your solid water or um, you actually have a, a solid water phantom that has the crosshairs already on there and you set up to that. Um, so once you've uh, set up your solid water phantom, you, we uh, go ahead and perform the output measurement. So, sorry, one more, one more question. Um, it says, is the um, output factor calculation in the plastic phantom valid if incidence on the patient is very oblique or when the beam goes through long? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll talk about the obliqueness. For the most part, when you're treating these patients, it's, it's almost like electrons you're treating on FOSS. Um, so uh, 
treating uh, treating from 180 or zero degrees if you have an electric machine won't really change. However, if you're concerned about the obliquity, which you which you could do is use your treatment planning system with your open beam that you've generated um, for your tumor volume, and um, take the um, basically the obliquity factor from it. So prescribe to um, your your 15 gray, 20 gray to your point. Um, get the the factor. Get the amount of monitor units, which will adjust based on the obliquity of your beam. In that case, it should only be the obliquity of your beam as well as um, beam shape. So you can take that factor and account for obliquity when you do it. We just, when we measure, we prefer to do it at 100 CMSSD straight on because we believe that when we're setting these beams up, we are um, fairly on thought to the patient. And just remember, this, this may not be the world's most accurate measurement. It's not it's not designed, I mean, it, it, it's, it's scary to think about, but this is not designed to be the, the most accurate field. It doesn't matter that I get 15 or 15.1 gray to this point. What I'm, what I'm trying to do is count for the grid and make sure I'm getting enough dose to this tumor volume. So basically, I mean, we're in general just trying to get a high dose to, to parts of um, the tumor. Um, he also asked me what happens if the beam goes through the lung. That's something you can take in consideration, although the, because of the specific nature of these patients, these are bulky tumors in these patients, large, um, large tumors. And in general, when you set these beams up, your beam should be penetrating the tumor. So this should be a tumor volume similar to water um, density that you're going through. So uh, I wouldn't uh, at that point be so concerned about going through lung because in general I should be entering and my point that I'm prescribing to should be in tumor volume, should be going through tumor volume. Um, but, but like I said, yes, there are some uncertainties here. There are some things that aren't um, exactly right and they're not, I'm not saying that that's, you know, generally how we do things, but um, we try to get as close as possible to these, this 15 gray that we're prescribing. And, and try to get dose to this patient. Try to incite a reaction. That's our main goal. Let's get an, a reaction going. Let's start this patient um, with a rapid response and then deliver the calculated, very well-planned therapy um, uh, after the fact. So um, your iron chamber measurement. So we'll take our iron chamber measurement for an open 10 by 10 uh, field at 100 cm SSD, a Dmax for your given energy, and we always use 100 monitor units. Clearly, you can use um, whatever monitor unit it is um, that, that you want, as long as they're the same across. So um, we deliver 100 monitor units with an open 10 by 10 at 100 cm and measure at D max. We then take, and we write down that measurement. We then upload or mode up our patient-specific field shaped by the MLCs for the given patient um, onto the LENAC. We insert our grid into the um, onto the gantry, and we deliver the same 100 to monitor units. So in this case, we're accounting for the size of the field and the insertion of the grid. So once we have those two measurements, because this is a relative output, um, this is a relative output measurement. This is how we calculate our output factor. So you can take your ion uh, chamber measurement with your grid, and you divide that by your ion chamber measurement with your open field, um, with it, delivering the same amount of monitor units for both, and that will give you your output factor. That will give you how much you should adjust your monitor units based on the insertion of the grid in your patient-specific field. And obviously, your output factor um, should be less than one because how, um, of how much you are blocking with the grid and you're comparing to an open field measurement. I have another question of concerns of signal to noise of such a small chamber um, with 100 monitor units. Um, I mean, this is, so, so this is what we use. If you, if you desire to use more monitor units, that's, that's fine. But because this is a relative measurement, I mean, um, we feel fairly confident using 100 monitor units with an open and 100 monitor units with our uh, closed field. This is, I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to account for the grid in the field and for the, the field size. So, um, and um, 
So if, if you have something that you believe will minimize the signal to noise or if uh, you have a different chamber or something like that, um, in general, I'm, I'm just trying to tell you that this is what we do and this is how um, we believe uh, that we are getting a fairly accurate measurement and uh, treating these grids um, fairly well. So um, let's say that. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, what is the typical value for an output factor? I'll, I'll show you right now. Actually, I'm going to show you an example on the bottom here. So because our machine is calibrated to deliver one centigrade per monitor unit at deep max for 100 cm SSD, your prescription dose in centigrade at that point will be equivalent to um, uh, what in monitor units, what you would expect for a 10 by 10 B with the same setup. So because that's how we've calibrated, that's the whole reason for setting it up at 100 cm SSD and for uh, putting it at the max, because we know that, okay, if we're prescribing 15 gray or 1500 centigray, that's equivalent to 1500 monitor units for this open 10 by 10 beam. Once we know, what, what we have that, now we know our output factor and we can adjust for the grid and the beam that we're using. So I show you an example here. So if you, you can calculate your monitor units by taking the prescription monitor units at this point, which since we're at our calibration location would be 1500 monitor units, and we're dividing by our output factor, which this answers um, your, your question here. This is, our, this is a very typical output factor for us. It's 0.894. Um, in general, the fields are, are pretty good size, so they don't affect the output uh, too much. And then once you insert your grid in there, obviously it's, uh, it will reduce your measurement some, but not, not huge. So that's a typical output measurement in our clinic is 0.894. That's actually what we've gotten for a couple of our patients now. And if you do the, the calculation, you'll see that in order to get the 15 gray at that point um, with the grid inserted, we, we got a 16, uh, approximately 1,678 uh, monitor units. So um, this hand calculation that we perform, this number of monitor units, we then use that for our patient treatment. So that's what we put into our record and verify system along with the field that's been exported from the treatment planning system. Uh, uh, we go ahead and deliver this total amount of monitor units in a single um, grid fraction. So when it comes time to deliver the treatment to the patient, uh, this is the kind of the workflow that we use for patient setup and localization at our clinic. You'll, you'll obviously have the, a different way of doing it at yours, but I'll go through what we do on a, on a typical patient. So. Um, we go ahead and bring the patient in, set them up as any other patient would. You mimic what you do in simulation. You uh, apply your shifts from stem isocenter to the beam isocenter designed by your dosimetrist. And then you will ver verify that you're at 100 centimeters SSD um, at your beam isocenter. We then take a cone beam for all of these patients because um, we want to be very accurate in setting the patient up and making sure that we have, um, are, are treating what we want to be treating. So we'll take a cone beam um, CT on our LENAC and apply any shifts necessary to match the cone beam with the CT stem. After we do that cone beam alignment, we will then um, uh, go ahead and mode up the actual patient's field and put it on, and uh, we will verify with the light field. This is a visual uh, to help us. We'll look at the light field, and we'll see, okay, we are, we are treating just the tumor. Our light field is on the tumor volume, and, and it's just a good check in that case. Then we will um, go out, take a port film of the actual um, field. So we'll take a port film, um, just how you would do it for any other patient, and it also just helps you verify, okay, I'm just treating the tumor, there's no normal tissues, and I'm in the area that I'm supposed to be, I'm where I'm supposed to be. We would then at this point go in, insert the grid into the treatment field. Um, you can also visualize the light field through the grid for a last and final check that you're only treating tumor volume, and then you can deliver, go ahead and deliver um, your grid uh, fraction. I have a question, do you ever have trouble getting a CBCT? Um, uh, in general, no. Uh, I mean, I guess you, you do have some couch kicks and things like that, but obviously we would do um, a, uh, we, we would do a CBCT with a patient at zero and just verify that kind of setup, and then we would adjust to the actual table position and do our port films there. So 
we, we, so far we've only treated head and necks, and we've had a pretty good, um, pretty good run with our CT, our CBCT. But, um, I and mean, that's obviously an extra second check. Um, if somebody just said, could you use parallel opposed ports with this technique? Um, you, I mean, you can use uh, port film. You can use um, that instead to localize if you feel that you can see what you need to see on a port film. That's all you need. And, you know, a light field is very helpful at the same time. You, you basically just need help verifying that you are indeed treating just tumor and not normal tissue and that you're treating what you said you were, you were intending to. Um, remember, the, the grid is just a, a single fraction and usually a single beam. So one beam. You don't treat from multiple angles. You don't do that because that's not the point of the grid. The grid is is to do a single shot uh, to get dosed into the tumor. You don't care about coming into the tumor from multiple sides. You don't care about covering more tumor. We, When we initially did this, we have our dosimetrist being a very good dosimetrist wanting to do um, multiple angles, couch kicks, let me let me treat the grid from this angle and this angle. That, that's not the design of the grid. The design of the grid is to treat in a single fraction, a single field, to get um, a good amount of dose into the tumor, into small portions of the tumor, into a, uh, and to incite a reaction. That's the goal of this. Okay, so we, we move on here. Um, Here's just a couple of our port films. Like I, I was telling you, we, we always do port films. So you can see in each of these uh, port films, I mean, they're, they're, port films are never great to, to look at completely. But you can see that you can visualize the MLCs and how you're only treating in your tumor volume and avoiding the normal tissues. And this, on the right case, you can kind of see where that chin is. And we, make, we made sure that we, our MLCs were indeed covering the chin as it was planned. Uh, I have another question here that says, uh, for a course of treatment, what would be your total dose, including the grid fraction? Um, I'll keep going, and you'll actually see that. But I mean, uh, for a typical pay case, all of these cases, we treated them definitively. We treated them with 15 gray for our grid, and we followed that with um, 2 gray per fraction times 35 to, a, to 70 gray. So we had the grid, and then we did 70 gray after the grid. Um, we, these were all treated definitively. If you're treating more of a palliative case, maybe you would go 300 centigrade times 10 fractions. And that's what you would do. But um, we, we just don't let we don't let it affect the way that we treat the patient afterwards. The grid does, does, is is for a reaction, and it's not for a cumulative of, um, dose effect. We don't look at that. Um, and, and here I'll go through a, a couple of our cases uh, real quick. I know my my time's kind of um, getting short, but I'll walk you through this first case example. Um, it was a 58-year-old male with squamous cell uh, carcinoma with an unknown primary, uh, but he had a very large protruding neck mass, and he was previously non-responsive to chemotherapy. So he received chemotherapy. It did not help this particular patient. It, he did not respond to it, and the tumor did not shrink. So um, we opted to treat him with 15 gray uh, for one fraction of grid therapy followed by 2 gray per fraction times 35 to a total dose of 70 gray after. So I'll walk you through um, how we do it, how, how this is exactly the, the process we went through. So upon CT simulation, you can see his large left uh, neck mass here on the left. Uh, that's what we were treating. So on the right, when we, when we stemmed him, you can see that we have his head turned in order to get his chin away from the tumor so that we can treat the, the bulk of the tumor. Um, we then, obviously, you import that into your treatment planning system. We set up our beam to get maximum coverage of our tumor and uh, eliminate any normal tissue interference. And then, um, similar to what we've always already said, uh, oops, sorry, skipped one there, uh, we export that, that field planned by the dosimetrist to the record and verify system, set up our water phantom with our ion chamber at 100 cm SSC with the chamber at D max. Uh, we deliver an open 10 by 10 field with 100 monitor units. And then we deliver the 100 monitor units with the patient specific field and our grid inserted. Uh, we found our output factor to be 0.894, which I showed um, earlier, and our hand calculation gave us 1678 monitor units uh, to treat this particular patient. I got a 
uh, question, which ion chamber do you use to comp uh, measure alpha factor? Um, like I said earlier, we use a pinpoint. We use a, um, a PTW pinpoint chamber. Um, but uh, you you use what you have in your clinic. Obviously, we use the pinpoint because it's a it's a fairly small field. But that's um, that's up to you and your physicist uh, to to decide. Uh, we then uh, once we have our amount of monitor units and we put uh, them into the record and verify system, we brought our patient, we localized them with CBCT, and then we took a port film to verify. You can see here you can only see tumor in that field. There's no normal tissues, no, uh, you know, no chin, no spine, no anything like that, no shoulder. We make sure to avoid that. And then we treated him with the uh, 1678 monitor units, or 15 gray. So um, let me walk you through the, the pictures we took of him as he went along his treatment. So for reminder's sake, there's the CT simulation we did. That's how large his tumor was at that point. After a couple months, we, we took some images of uh, his tumor there, and you can see a couple of months, he's still undergoing his um, external beam uh, radiation, and you can see how much it shrank at this point. This is uh, by, purely by radiation and uh, receiving external beam afterwards. Um, let me have a quick question. This is bolus being used over these bulky protruding tumors? I will say yes for when we when we treated them um, I, with, the, with the conventional radiation after um, our grid, we did use bolus. For the grid, we did not use bolus. It's not really, um, wasn't really the aim, because it's just to get dose into the tumor. We're not really caring about pulling up surface dose uh, for the grid. But yes, after we treated for these bulky tumors, we definitely used grid, because obviously you want to treat all the way to the surface uh, for your conventional radiation therapy. Um, for the, all of these patients, we did actually treat them. Somebody gave me a question. Uh, we did treat them with IMRT, so it was two gray, ten thirty-five. They were all IMRT uh, cases because they had not only um, the exterior involvement that you're going to see here, but large amounts of involvement up in the facial area and down. So um, yes, we we felt that IMRT was much more necessary and much more um, beneficial to the patient than conventional in in the cases for these patients. So we treated them all with IMRT. Um, I'll keep going and show you a couple more uh, reactions from him. So um, uh, a week later, you see um, here's another image from external beam. So his tumor is much smaller. You will see a bit of a skin reaction. Uh, no grade 3 toxicity, as, as uh, we mentioned before. Uh, but uh, you can see that uh, he's tolerating it fairly well, and the tumor is, is, is shrinking uh, quite nicely. Um, on the right there, you'll see him after his final treatment. That was after his final radiation therapy treatment, immediately after. Um, and you can see where the tumor is at. And then um, he came back two months, almost two months later for a follow-up, and we'll continue to follow up. Uh, this was a couple weeks ago, and it, uh, the skin is healing very nicely. He's doing very well. And um, uh, his tumor is, you know, it's it stayed at bay and it's not growing, regrowing at this point, and uh, we were very happy with uh, those results. Let me go a couple more questions here. It says, is there a wait time between grid fraction and conventional treatment? Um, in general, no. You, I mean, you can treat grid one day and go to external beam the very next. Um, a lot of the times, we'll treat our grids maybe on a Friday, give them Saturday and Sunday off, and then um, start their external on Monday. But yeah, in general, you want to just keep treating. You want to, you want to keep getting dose to the tumor, and the, because these are so advanced and they're so rapidly growing, um, you, you need to get dose to this tumor. It's not, it will not benefit you to wait long periods of time after the grid before you start um, uh, your normal uh, planning, your normal treatment, sorry. I got a, another question. How many adaptive or revised plans were required to account for the tumor shrinkage? That's, that's a good question. Um, for this particular patient, we did one uh, replan. We kind of monitored him as we went along with CBCT, and um, we monitored and we, you know, we recalculated on the CBCTs, the new CTs, to kind of see um, what the dose was looking like. And, and the most, the majority of the time, it was just heating up the actual tumor volume, and we were okay with it. He did require one replan. We did adjust his dose and his plan uh, once throughout the course of treatment to account for how how much the tumor had shrank. Uh, but that's up to you and your clinic and how you feel. But 
it's, it's very important to keep an eye. We did daily CBCTs on these patients to keep an eye on how their tumor is progressing. And if you, if you think that the tumor growth is, uh, uh, not the tumor growth, but actually the tumor shrinkage is enough to where you would we want to re-CT and want to replan. Um, and that's the same uh, question I got there. How often do you re-stem during treatment? So um, for this patient, we ended up re-stemming him uh, once because we've, we've monitored with the cone beams daily. Uh, but then we ended up uh, actually re-stemming him uh, fully uh, once during treatment and replanning at that point. Uh, is conventional um, RT? Let me see. Is conventional RT alone uh, expected to produce poorer results? Um, in these patients, the reason we did the grid is because our physicians believed, and similar to the case that Mahudin showed in the, the third paper I talked to you about before. That if we treated them conventionally, if we did two gray per fraction to times 35 to 70 gray, that that the patient wouldn't respond. Uh, the patient would actually, the tumor would actually grow. Um, so we do believe that for these patients, and obviously we can't prove that at this point because we treated grid beforehand. But we will tell you that we treated them uh, such that we. Um, believe that a traditional external beam might actually cause the tumor to grow and not to um, regress as we wished. Uh, have I think I, I think I already answered this question. It says, have you found a need to replan the conventional course due to tumor response? Yes, in all of these patients, we at least replanned once because we were concerned about that. Um, did you do two CT, one with the head turned for grid and one with the head straight? Yes, um, the answer is yes. The, for the grid treatments, we always turn the head because we're trying to get maximal tumor um, exposure. However, for the IMRT, for treatment setup, it's, it's much more important to have the head straight. So we would do a second um, uh, CT stem with the patient straight with a new mask for IMRT. Uh, the last question is, did you bill a complex treatment for the grid and then IMRT for ongoing treatment? Um, we, we build this, um, and to be quite honest with you, I don't do the billing. I don't know exactly what we charge uh, for the grid. You may have to um, ask your billing or your coders or whoever it is that um, does that for you, or, or you know, maybe we can get in touch with Dot Decimal and ask them. Uh, I know we, we build something for the grid, and it, it could have been a special physics consult at the very least for that, but um, that would be something to ask them. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Um, it says, uh, ever use this for retreat if previous conventional XRT failed? At our clinic, we have not. We've always decided to use the, the grid up front. However, um, there are many published papers talking about them using this because traditional RT failed, and they're using it, you know, or they're even using it mid-treatment because RT is not working, uh, conventional RT is not working. So it, yes, it's been done. Uh, however, we have not uh, yet done that here. Um, um, sorry, uh, let me let me hurry up and get through the next cases. They'll be real quick. I'll show you the pictures because we're we're really running out of time. And then any questions, I'll, I'll get to them. So this uh, second case is a 40-year-old male with squamous cell carcinoma of the tongue. He had a very large fungating mask on his upper chest slash neck. Uh, he was non-responsive to chemotherapy prior um, to this treatment, so we opted to treat him with a grid 15 gray times one fraction, followed by two gray for 35 fractions to 70 gray. This patient it was not our ideal patient. He oftentimes wouldn't show. He wouldn't come. Uh, he uh, missed several treatments, ended up not coming for his last uh, conventional treatment. So he received only 68 out of 70 gray, and that was uh, his treatment time was extended very greatly. He would maybe come in once or twice a week versus the five times a week that we were asking. And he unfortunately has not returned for follow-up, but what I can show you is his response during the treatment. And there was response. So in CT stem, you can see on the left, that's how it began. Uh, the tumor was rapidly growing and um, very large. A month later, um, it may be slightly hard to see, but you, uh, if you look closer, there is definitely a tumor response that is shrinking at this point. And I'll go to um, a month after that. You can see, and I mean, it's, it's very evident on the skin itself. You can see where the tumor used to be and now where the tumor is. So you can see how much it regressed in the two months that he was here versus it was continuing to grow and grow and grow prior to this treatment. 
and um, this was him near the end of, uh, near, close to the end of his treatment. Although I, I do believe that if he came every day, if uh, he followed the, the proper, um, what was prescribed to him daily, then he, he may have had a better response, but he did respond to either way. And here is actually, he came into another clinic uh, we actually got the images. He has not been back to our clinic, but he came into somewhere else. And this is a CT. Uh, this is actually his SIM CT on the left, and the CT he received. And this is it's, it's close to the same area as we could get. Um, and you can see that the area where that used to be tumor is um, no longer uh, tumor. It's no longer there. There is some tumor left over, but there is a large um, gap where the tumor used to be. The third example is our most recent, and uh, so I don't have a ton of images because he's still on treatment, but he's a 43-year-old male, squamous cell carcinoma of the oropharynx with a right parotid primary. He was also non-responsive to chemotherapy and had a very large uh, bulky tumor on his neck and upper face. We treated him the same as the last two, 15 gray for one fraction and 2 times 35 to 70 gray. Here he is on the left in CT simulation with his head turned. That's what we use for the grid, straight for IMRT. So his head is turned here. And this is him prior to grid on the right when he came in for his treatment. You can see he does have this large protruding mass off of his chin and neck area. Um, like I said, I don't have many uh, pictures of him. He's, he's ongoing treatment now, and we're kind of working on that. But I can show you um, his CT simulation on the left. And he is responding. We have seen some response from him um, and his external beam uh, CBCT from, uh, in, during treatment is here on the right. And you will see that the tumor is smaller, it is shrinking, and it is uh, responding the way uh, we were hoping. So um, just in a brief conclusion, so grid therapy is a technique that, can, that may benefit large advanced tumors. Uh, doing, due to limitations for treating these bulky large tumors uh, with high doses of radiation because of your normal tissues, you can use grid therapy to treat a large portion of the tumor while sparing your skin and your surrounding normal tissues. Uh, grids treating a large single fraction, anywhere from 15 to 20 gray, to incite what you hope is a rapid tumor response. And you can limit your skin toxicities using this spatial treatment. Um, finally, the grid followed by conventional radiotherapy can effectively and um, safely uh, treat rapidly growing tumors uh, using your grid compensator provided by dot decimal instead of using MLCs can save you uh, significant treatment time, total monitor units, and low dose leakage and higher surface dose that you may get using an MLC. In general, these are very quick and easy to plan. You can use the compensator over and over and over. Use it for every patient that you need it for. Um, and there are many previously published studies that prove the efficacy of the technique and how it can help your patient, how help these specific patients with large uh, tumors. And here are um, the references I used. And obviously, there are, there are more out there. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Let me uh, grab some the rest of these questions here, if I can. There's a lot of them. I see one of them says, how much does the grid cost? Uh, the dot decimal people I just talked to before this, what they are, they have it on right now is um, uh, it's $19.95, so just under $2,000 for the grid. But remember, you use this for every patient, and it, it lasts. That's, you know, you don't, it's a one-time purchase. Um, uh, one output factor for all. We actually do patient-specific measurements for all of ours, but um, it hasn't proved to be completely necessary. In general, we find them to be all the same, 0.89 or, or so. Uh, but we feel more comfortable doing patient-specific output measurements, so we measure them for, for all of them. We don't do this on a daily basis, so it's, it's not uh, very taxing on physics to do a patient-specific measurement. Um, if GRID has been used for years and works so well, why isn't it more widespread? Um, I'm not sure I can answer that. I guess that's the, the whole point of this seminar is to, is to get the word out to show you. They've been using this. The GRID's been in use for over 50 years now. You can look back for publications. It is there, and it, it, it does work. I, don't, um, I can't tell you exactly why more people aren't using it, but maybe um, they will be in the future. 
um, is grid therapy well accepted by RMDs in general? I would say yes. They are very, they've been very excited about it, very, um, very responsive and open to it. Um, it's a little bit scary at first, but uh, after your first couple of cases, they feel pretty good about it. And when you see the results, when you see these patients, it, um, it, it, it helps a lot to answer any questions that you might have had. Uh, what is the turnaround time to make the grid from dot decimal? Uh, I can tell you it took them about maybe a week for us. It was very quick. Um, they are very good to work with, easy to work with. They'll get, they'll get you your grid uh, very quickly. Have we treated only three cases so far? Yes. Uh, we have another case coming that we just uh, saw in consult a week or so ago. So um, yes, we've only treated three so far, and we, we've only been using it for four or five months. And, and you know, we're very specific about the patients that we we will use for these things. So um, actually, three is a pretty good amount for for that amount of time. So, um, but we will be using it more, and we have more patients coming that will require it. Um, let's see. Uh, will you reuse concurrent chemo RT for conventional IMRT after the grid treatment? Um, some, I know at least one of our patients was concurrent chemo um, during current chemo RT during, after the grid. So um, yes, you can do that. It can happen. That's, that's obviously a call by the, the MD as well as the medical oncologist. That's, uh, but um, yes, you can, you can do it. We, we have done it, for, especially for those that are very, very aggressive and they feel that they need that as well. Is there a special charge capture for this? I, I think I kind of answered this earlier. I'm, I'm not a coder. I, I don't generally do the billing. Um, I'm sure that there is a special charge capture. Um, we at least do a special physics because we do special physics measurements and things like that. So we do charge that. But I, I can't answer for any of the other more specific charges. Um, I wonder why grid is usually written in capitals. <laughs> was an acronym more like IMRT. It's not an acronym. Sorry, I just, uh, I use it. Um, uh, I got a, a nice question from someone I used to work with. Thanks, uh, Nick. Um, <laughs> is there any contraindication for GRID? Um, I mean, not that I've read. Obviously, that's not really what the studies were published for. They were published to show how well it works. So I. I can only speak to the the public the what I've read that's been published that uh, it's, it's worked very well and, and in general it's in the majority of cases you do see a, a good response or a response which is what you're looking for. Do you use factors like off-axis ratio? Um, do you compensate for the non-tissue non-tissue air in the field being considered for the grid field? Um, so off axis ratio, everything like that, so that, you're taking your output measurement with your actual patient's field, so you're accounting for um, most things when you do that. When you actually mode up the actual patient field with the grid in it and you take your output factor, you're accounting for your field that's been drawn, um, the, any off axis ratio. The only thing I did talk about earlier not accounting for is the obliquity, and you can take in, that into account with your treatment planning system. If you would like, we don't because we, in general, treat these on FOSS and um, we believe it to be um, uh, fairly accurate um, delivering it, um, the output factor on FOSS as well. Um, but uh, yeah, the, most of those things are going to be encompassed in your um, output factor uh, measurement when you mode up the correct beam and your, um, with your grid in the field. Um. I think that, that's all I have. I don't. I, that's all the questions. I think I got to all of your questions uh, there. And oh, hold on, I have one more here. Uh, it says, "Will you put Vaseline bolus to fill up the gas for the later IMRT treatment?" That's something up to you. We we have tried techniques where we um, actually use bolus to try to make up for the tissue that's no longer there throughout treatment, and we we have. Um, we have done that, uh, but I will say that there comes a point in the treatment, and we always found a point, at least midway through the treatment, where we felt like the tumor had just changed too much, and we felt more comfortable re-stimulating and replanning. But yeah, if, if you if you feel pretty confident about using the bolus to fill up any gaps, um, then it's definitely something you can use 
during the course of treatment as a, as a quick, quicker fix than a re-stimming and replanning. 